And what horses look like then? Olivia? Fossils are one real important source of evidence that shows us how species have evolved. So fossil evidence is a big one. What is a fossil? Daniel? It's remains that are still not gone. Okay. I guess by remains means it's not gone, does it, Hannah? Uh, remains an emblem from like long ago. Yeah, they are. Um, impressions, trails, bones that have been preserved in rock usually. Um, oh, hold on, sorry. No, that one you wrote down. So fossil evidence. And so here are some fossils. This is a trilobite fossil and a mammal fossil and so forth. But we can see, and, so, and people have found fossils for a long, long period of time. Back in ancient Greece, people would stumble upon fossils that they found and find that they knew these species don't seem to be anywhere on Earth anymore. And so fossils can show some species that have become extinct. They can also show us what some modern species might have looked like millions of years ago okay, by studying those fossils. So fossils are one important source of evidence that tells us that species have changed over time. How do you know it's a horse, though? What if it looks like a you tell by looking at all of the parts, and you could see that horses have certain unique characteristics. And by finding those in fossils that were even around millions of years ago, you could say, oh, this must have been the ancestor of a horse. So by looking at those common features down. Whales have fingers? We're, we're not there yet. Anna? Um, like, they found out that by looking at the inner ear fossil of a whale, they could find out that um, it used to be a man creature. Yeah, and by looking at various features, um, you can tell sort of a lot about an animal or a plant or any other creature by its remains. A scientist can tell much more than you probably would think based just on those remains. All right, so that's one thing, is that we can look at fossils. Another thing we can look at is what we call common structures. If you look at different species alive today, you can find some similarities that help understand how they've evolved and how they are related to each other. This diagram down here, this shows the bones that are present if you were to look inside a whale flipper, a frog, a horse, a lion, a human, a bat, and a bird. So if you look at the bones that make up their limbs, you could see some similarities. Look at the human arm. I'm sure you're familiar with the human arm. We have one upper arm bone, the humerus. It's the top of your arm. In your forearm, lower half of your arm, you have two bones, the ulna and the radius. Then you have a bunch of small wrist bones, and then your finger bones. If you look at, look at the whale's flipper, even though it looks sort of just like a flipper, like maybe a fish's fin, when you actually look inside of the flipper at the bones, they also, whales have one upper arm bone, two forearm bones, wrist bones and finger bones, just like other mammals. So what do you think that might tell us about whales? Down? Yeah, that they're not, so, you know, people may look at a whale and say, oh, it looks kind of like a, a dolphin or a shark, that must be a fish. But it's not. And by looking at some of these things, we can see why, okay? The fin of a dolphin, I mean the fin of a shark, and the fin of a fish, they don't have bones inside them. They look completely different. But a dolphin or a whale, which are mammals, have bones that are very similar to other mammals. And you can see that. You can see some of the other species as well. <coughs> look at the bat wing. Same thing. You have one upper arm bone, two forearm bones. And most of those, those long bones in the bat, they're actually finger bones that over time have evolved to be very long and they have a flap of skin stretched over them that form the bat's wings. And it's much different than the wings of a bird. And so these common features can help us understand how species are related to each other and how they've evolved over time. Okay, we can also look at something called species distribution. We can look at where different species live. Often
oftentimes species that live in a similar area are similar to each other because species over time can spread out and slowly adapt to different conditions. Also, oftentimes we have isolated areas, islands and so forth. Okay, think about Australia. Oftentimes on islands that are separated from other areas, you have very unique species because in those areas, species have evolved separately from all the other species and so often they have unique characteristics. And we'll look at a video that shows these are types of salamanders in what state is this? California. California. And this, these salamanders all started as one species. But as they moved down through California, they started to adapt differently and became more and more different from one another. We can look at the DNA. Oh, this is the video. Let me show you this video. This is about the salamanders. I'll turn this up. Meet a type of terrestrial salamander found in California. Now meet another. And another. These salamanders are members of the same species, so why do they look and behave so differently? In California, populations of these salamanders became separated geographically, evolving over millions of years to adapt to different environments. They've changed so much that they are on their way to becoming entirely separate species. David Wake of the University of California, Berkeley, explains. The history of this species complex began about 10 million years ago in the ancient redwood forests of Northern California, where we have today this form picta, which is highly variable both genetically and in terms of coloration. There were two migratory routes followed by animals as they moved into Southern California. One along the Sierra Nevada mountain chain, where animals moved into the forested region, the other along the coastal mountains, they avoided the Great Central Valley. The populations that gradually <coughs> moved down the forest region of California relied on blending in with their environment. Animals with good camouflage tended to survive more and produce offspring with similar traits. As the salamanders progressed south over millions of years, the markings became more distinct. At the end of the chain in Southern California, we have this one cloud ride, which is the uh, extreme of variation showing the largest blotches, most bold marking. These were all the camouflaged organisms that were hiding from predators. Along the coast, a different strategy was followed. Here, the organisms adopted the color pattern and behavior of dangerously poisonous newts, and they became, instead of camouflaged, they were advertising their resemblance to these dangerously poisonous animals and gaining an advantage because of their mimicry. So what happened is that you had two differently adapted lineages moving to the south. And by the time they reached the southern town, they had essentially evolved into different species. But at certain areas, for example, in the Palomar Mountain area in San Diego County, you get these animals, which are hybrids, and the hybrids are neither similar to the dangerously poisonous animals, they're not good mimics, nor are they good animals in terms of camouflage. So these organisms are essentially dead ends. These hybrid offspring are not well adapted to their environment and are therefore less likely to survive. The two parent subspecies that produce the hybrids are well on their way to becoming entirely separate species, evolving just as Darwin described in his theory of evolution. I think Darwin would love this example because it shows exactly the sorts of, of patterns that he was talking about. Gradual adaptive divergence, leading eventually to the establishment of the new species. All right, so what you see there, those salamanders, as they move down through California, salamanders that were in the central parts of California, they evolved to be more camouflaged because there are a lot of predators and that was helpful to them, and so that became a more common characteristic. The salamanders that were along the coast, 
they became brightly colored um, to sort of scare off predators that thought they might be poisonous. So both of those groups of salamanders just changed over time, and they're on their way to becoming two different species as they're getting more and more different from each other. So we can tell by species and where they're located um, how species have evolved. We can also look at DNA evidence. You know, inside our bodies, we'll be talking about in our next unit, our DNA, our genes. Okay. And some similar, similar species have similar DNA. We can compare the DNA of two organisms and see how closely related they are. Okay. Um, and so that's another example of using uh, evidence to see how species have evolved. So we know that species over time change. But how does this happen? How can a group of organisms get different over time? The process that allows it to happen is called natural selection. And let's we'll talk about some pretty simple examples. Here I have some mice. <coughs> let's say there's different varieties of this species of mice. Some have light colored fur and some have darker colored fur. Which ones do you think these predators are going to find and eat first? Holly? The darker fruit ones. How come? Because they stand out more in the environment. Well, look at their environment. Oh, I mean the lighter ones. The lighter ones in this case stand out more. Probably they're more likely going to be eaten. If they get eaten, that means they can't, they're not going to get older. They're not going to probably reproduce. The darker colored ones are probably going to survive longer. If they can survive longer, they're more likely to reproduce. When they have baby mice, what will their baby mice probably be like? Yeah? Lighter. Well, I don't know. If they're darker fur, what will their offspring be like? Darker. Also probably darker fur. And so over time, what you may have is all of these mice in the whole population might be darker in color. And there'll be fewer and fewer of these light colored ones because they get eaten so often. And that's called natural selection. Dana? Um, one of the, like, say if one of the salamanders had, like, a baby, would, like, the baby be its original species, or would it be, would it the, the, the baby, the offspring, would be like the parent. Okay, so the parents generally give birth to offspring that have similar characteristics to them. All right, so natural selection boils down to the fact that, um, there's my uh, bird. Um, that living things that are well adapted to their environment will survive and reproduce more. What happens to living things that are not well adapted? Reproduce. What's that? Reproduce. Do, if they're not well adapted to their environment, they, they don't reproduce. They die. They're eaten or they don't survive. Have you ever heard of survival of the fittest? Yes. That same it means that the individuals that have the best characteristics, that are most well adapted, are going to survive better. Those that are not well adapted, they're not going to make it. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. So how do species evolve? Well, first off, it's called natural selection. And in natural selection, the best adapted, the individuals that are best suited to their environment, and survive better and reproduce, passing on those good characteristics to the next generation. <coughs> individuals that are not well adapted, unfortunately for them, they often die out before they can reproduce. Imagine like imagine a hawk. Do hawks have good vision? Yes. Yeah, they're able to sight prey from far up in the air, swoop down, grab it. What happens if some hawks are born with poor vision? You know, because just like you know, people sometimes are born with poor, poor vision. Israel? Oh, uh, they won't be able to see um, their prey high up in the sky. Yeah, probably they're not going to see prey very easily. But probably then what? Do 
you think they'll have children? They can't see their prey very easy. What's that mean, Daniel? They, they might not get enough food to survive, and they may not be able to reproduce because they didn't survive. Okay? So um, those traits that are harmful will become less and less common because those individuals can't survive. So that's what happens in evolution. Over time, beneficial, good traits become more and more common, and any harmful traits become less common. And that leads over a period of time to evolution. That's why we have so many different species on Earth. When we talk about evolution and natural selection, we say that there are four steps, four things that have to happen in order for natural selection to take place. Variation, struggle for survival, reproduction, and adaptation. We'll talk about each of them. First is variation. What does that mean? Variation. Tommy? Changes. Haley? There's differences, different kinds. Yeah, that's what variation means. So, you know, um, if you think about humans, for example, is there a lot of variation between two people? Sure. There's variations in height, in eye color, in um, strength, in hair color, in um, the shape of people's faces. There's all sorts of variations between humans. We're, because we are humans, we're very good at seeing all those differences. But when we look at another species, say you look at squirrels, do squirrels have as many variations as humans? No. They actually probably do. But we don't notice that, because we are not squirrels. Squirrels, when they look at each other, can probably tell each squirrel apart. And they probably say, no, we don't look anything alike. Right? All you humans look alike. Um, but you're, we're tuned in to differences between humans. But in all species, there's variation. Not every um, mouse is exactly alike. Okay? Not, every, um, not every boa constrictor is exactly alike. There's variations in the pattern on their scales and variations in size and all sorts of things. And that's important. So in each population, each individual is unique. Now sometimes these differences can be helpful to the individual. Sometimes they can be harmful. Sometimes they don't really matter either way. I always start with this variation. If there is some characteristic, some trait, that helps an organism to survive, we say that it has adaptive value. So we have variation or differences. We also have, often in nature, the struggle for survival. Not all of the organisms that are born can possibly survive. For example, some species of fish, one female can lay hundreds of thousands of eggs. Do they all grow into adult fish? No. no. If they did, then we would, our, our rivers would be clogged with fish, but they don't. Only a small percent actually make it to adult fish. How come? What happened? Why don't they all make it? Kristen? Predators. Predators eat a lot of the eggs before they ever even have a chance to grow. Olivia?
Yeah. What else? There's just too many. There's not enough food for them all to live. So some of them starve to death. Some just are have genetic problems and they never can grow. Yeah, there's all sorts of reasons why only a small percentage make it into adulthood. But which ones do make it? Which ones will make it into adulthood? Yeah? Sometimes. 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 Sometimes the fastest. Sometimes the smartest. But whichever the case may be, it's the ones that have the best characteristics for their situation are the ones that survive. Okay? Okay? The best adapted will be the ones that survive. survive the best adapted if they can survive and live through into adulthood they can then do what it's the next step Olivia reproduce they can reproduce and when they do Daniel exactly the offspring of those that survive are also going to have those good characteristics that allow their parents to survive. And over many generations, generation after generation, any traits that are helpful to the species become more and more common in the group. Any traits that are harmful become less and less common in the group. Until over time, the whole species has those characteristics and the species has changed over time. We call that adaptation. Okay? And adaptation is a trait, a characteristic that helps the species survive. Now, does that mean that a species will gain whatever characteristics it needs in order to survive? Does it mean some, let's say rabbits, for example, are being preyed upon by fox? It might be helpful for rabbits to have wings and be able to fly away. Is that going to happen? No. No, that's not going to happen. The variation has to be there within the species from the beginning in order for natural selection to increase it. Okay? So it has to be a, a natural characteristic, a variation within that group in order for natural selection to work. So that's the basics of natural selection and how it works. It's, it's not very complicated. There's some differences between the individuals. The ones with the best characteristics survive longer and reproduce, passing on those characteristics to their offspring, and over a long period of time, those traits that are helpful become more and more common until the entire species has them, and we call them adaptation. When you take this over millions and millions of years, it allows species to change over time. Any questions about that? All right, we'll continue on um, tomorrow.